All right, so I'm closing the poll. So I hope you guys can uh, can see the poll. Uh, so I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised, surprised here. I can see that the, the majority of people, of the participants at least, participated in at least uh, one retrospective in the last uh, couple of months, in spite of the fact that it's uh, probably remote all the time. So it uh, definitely makes it harder. So uh, it's great to see. And some of you have actually participated uh, in uh, in three or more, so that's uh, that's pretty nice. So thank you very much for your input. So I'm seeing that uh, some of you found out that there's a way to to chat. So there's a question there already. So uh, we'll get to the questions later on. We'll leave some time for uh, for questions. So uh, let's get started. So welcome everyone. Let me see. Let me just make sure that I can move to the next slide. All right. So the topic is uh, team level retrospective. In, in case it wasn't clear uh, in the in the invitation, uh, we're going to be focusing on the team level retrospectives, in particular on uh, how to uh, to have good retrospective uh, in a remote setting, which is uh, obviously very actual uh, given the situation. Uh, so obviously there's uh, the, the additional situations like uh, program level, organization level, project level retrospectives. These are important uh, as well. And some of the tips we're going to be uh, talking about are relevant to those situations as well. But here we're going to be focusing mostly on team level retrospectives. Just a, a few, few words about myself. I'm Sagi Smolarski. I'm located in a place called Ranana. I'm assuming that uh, there's a critical mass of people attending from Israel, but we'll see that in a second. Uh, but I, I see already there are some people from uh, different locations. So Ranani is essentially in the outskirts of Tel Aviv in Israel. Uh, right now I'm a, I'm a coach, uh, a developer and a manager still. And I've been a, a developer and a manager for quite a long time, about uh, probably around 25 years, so quite a while. And oops, and uh, I'm part of the uh, Agile, uh, Agile Sparks team. We are a, a boutique consulting firm. Uh, dealing with the organizational improvement, in particular for uh, companies which develop, develop software uh, products or software and hardware combination of products. So that's the I think uh, pretty much the the whole team. And uh, I'd love to hear where are you guys from. So um, I'll, I'll share a link in the chat, chat or if you can, can please uh, get into the link. You can just put a flag just. Uh, uh, co uh, use Control D or Control C, Control V on uh, those uh, sort of uh, callouts, and put your name and your location. So I can get uh, overall a, a reading for uh, where, where you guys are located. So let me just share the link. Right, right, in the chat, chat, chat you can see link, you can navigate, and you should be able to, to get in and uh, contribute your input. That's, That's uh, based on Google Slides, a pretty nice way to, uh, to actually collaborate. You can use it at, as sort of a whiteboard, and you can just uh, grab any of those uh, those callouts, just copy them, move them to the right location, and type in your name. So we'll, we'll just, just take, take a couple, couple of minutes, minutes for that. So as you can see, I, I created the, the Zoom team map for, uh, for Israel, just assuming that the, the majority of the people are going to be in Israel. And so far, it seems to be the case. Let's see if we have people from uh, from India, from one seem, what seems to be Eastern Europe. And someone from Brazil, yeah. is that correct?
Okay, so one more minute. So guys, you can still copy the, just grab one of the, the callouts for a person who already created one and just you know, do a control D and then move it around. So we are not out of the callout. There's no limit. Argentina. OK, sorry. Brazil, I guess I'm wrong. And Chandru is even sort of upside down. All right, so pretty much all over the place, but definitely a majority from, uh, from Israel. So thank you very much, guys, for your input. It's very interesting to see that we are pretty much spread across the globe. All right, so back to the presentation. All right, this is loading. OK, so to, just to uh, set the context a little bit, so operating a software development team is uh, quite expensive. Uh, one thing I looked up at the time is uh, what's the cost of operating a fighter jet. And uh, if you compare the cost, at least for uh, Western countries, so it's about the same cost, about $1 million to operate uh, a jet plane, um, in particular the F-16, which is one of the cheaper uh, jets to operate. And a team is about, uh, has a run rate of about the same. So uh, we definitely want to be as, as uh, effective as we can. Uh, and uh, as you probably uh, all the times are changing and uh, has been sort of, uh, of a, a discontinuity in the way we work, uh, up until recently, we were mostly co-located. I mean, remote or fully remote, fully distributed situation was more of an exception. And as of late, we, we have become, you know, fully distributed. And that definitely makes, thing, makes things more challenging, in particular uh, uh, when we are talking about uh, retrospectives. And I think that, uh, that discontinuity makes it harder to, uh, to set up a retrospective or to hold a good retrospective, but it makes it even more important because in times of changes, we need to adjust and uh, to adapt rapidly. Otherwise, you know, we uh, definitely uh, lose some time, lose some firepower, become less productive. So it's really, really important to uh, keep up the, the continuous improvement momentum. And uh, as, as it was before, the, the main definition of what a great retrospective is, uh, same the definition applies uh, still nowadays. Uh, so to me, uh, virtual retrospective is all about helping us as a team become a better team. And that, and that means, means that we want to, to tackle the most important challenges and opportunities. It's not only about the challenges, the uh, Make sure to develop a realistic plan, which is relevant to those uh, uh, top challenges and opportunities. Uh, we want to have uh, the people which are going to be typically the team members Willing to take out in this action plan, so uh, take ownership of the action item to come out of this uh, of this session. We want it to be participative, so so it's not uh, only a subset of the team members that are very vocal and uh, have opinion about the uh, things uh, we should uh, change or preserve. But we definitely want to have uh, all team members have uh, a voice heard, and we, we definitely want to have uh, some fun in it. We want it to be energetic, fun, so that. Uh, and, uh, and definitely have a good return on investment so that people are uh, definitely looking forward to participating in the next one. And uh, last but not least, I think the last one is uh, sort of, uh, it's part of, a, sort of a, a continuum. So it's not like an isolated event, but you know, continuous improvement is something that should be with, uh, with us. We should be working on that you know, continuously. And that's really, that really should be a, a part of that continuous improvement and uh, help us preserve the momentum in that aspect. So 
So that's, uh, that's in my mind what, uh, what the great retrospective is all about. And uh, one thing I'd like to uh, to do, I'd like to hear from you, is uh, what are your top challenges with the retrospectives, so we can make sure to emphasize you know, the, the right aspects of the of the retrospectives. So I'll share again. I'll share a link. This is going to be to a different tool, also from Google, but uh, it's going to be Jamboard, and uh, there as well you can copy and uh, add some Jamboard. Actually, it's a it's a it's a drawing. It's very similar. Guys, I just, uh, just noticed that uh, there's an echo. Uh, um, trying to think what I can do about that. I, I only have one microphone as far as I know. So uh, let me just share the link. And while, while you guys fill this out, I'll try to, uh, to tweak the, the voice. Let me see. So now I'm, uh, I'm using the, uh, the built-in mic from, uh, from my desktop, uh, from my laptop. Is that, uh, is that, is that any better? better? And the speaker is definitely not on. Uh, everything is on mute. So it should be OK, but I'm not sure. So uh, everything, I think, is on mute. Sounds oh, still choppy. Let me see if I can change it. Yeah. Let me check. Yeah, that's almost all preferences. Let me see if I can tweak that. One, two. I can reduce the volume a little bit. One, two. Okay. Essentially, there's only one, one microphone here. I think it should be okay. If I mute that, can you still hear me? When I mute that, maybe it's a different source somehow. Can you guys hear me now? All right. OK. It's better. OK, so we leave it like that. So I don't know. Apparently, there's a phantom microphone somewhere. We'll have to. Uh, to check it out. All right. So let's see what we have here. So team is not open to share everything. OK. Uh, different technique. Getting people to open up. People turning on their cameras, definitely a challenge. But it's definitely a, a good idea to do that. People staying on mute instead of opening mic. Shy. OK. People skeptical if we if we obey power to change things up. No sharing the ideas, no effective participation. English is poor. OK. OK, so we'll just give it one more minute. Actually, it's too much for long term. Background noises. So I can, as you can see, audio quality is, uh, is definitely a, a challenge. It is here as well. Noisy environment. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for the input. So I'll uh, let me try to address every one of those issues. All right. So let's get back to presentation mode.
Okay, so it's going up. So there are definitely quite a few challenges. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about the challenge. So the property agenda, I think, will be talking about. I tried to organize it uh, pretty much in a uh, chronological order, so pretty much by the different stages I would expect to have in a retrospective. So we'll definitely address the issues that we are uh, still brought up. So I think a great retrospective starts with the preparation. So the preparation is very important. So here I created sort of a rough timeline, not, enough, not, uh, not exact, but uh, first thing is obviously I think you know the one thing that I can give you is to uh, it, it's at its best to schedule it right after the sprint review so that people have the uh, the information, the data, the insights about what the sprint uh, actually uh, conclude in mind. Uh, what I've seen uh, oftentimes is that uh, it's it's uh, completely separate, can be you know two days apart, three days apart, or, or even more. And I think uh, that people tend to forget. So try uh, uh, this. Uh, this can be really back to back, uh, right? So you have the sprint review right after the. Uh, the retrospective, and one, one thing that I've seen that uh, some scrum masters do and that is, is, a, a, uh, uh, is a great idea is, is to have people do a think about insight ahead of time. So one week before or a couple of days before, they send out an email that asks, uh, people to write down it's just to themselves, not to publish it or uh, to make it any tool, but just you know to write uh, themselves what are their insights about the retrospective. Or even to do that, you know, as part of the uh, the, retrospective, the the sprint itself. So uh, that's one, uh, one thing. Uh, in addition, I definitely want to have a facilitator. There's going to be you. I mean, if you're a Scrum Master, it's going to be you. It doesn't have to be you. There can be a guest, uh, guest facilitator. It can be anyone else from the team. I think it's like, uh, actually a good practice to actually share the responsibility within the team. About all the people, we definitely want to, uh, to come up with a plan for the facilitation. So we give the feedback from the last perspective. If the work collected, we talk about the feedback about the retrospective, they definitely want to uh, translate uh, into changes. So, if it wasn't going up, was an issue, try to think about ways to uh, address those. Uh, you want to create an agenda, and we'll uh, actually look at a template for, a template for such an agenda. We will build it together to some extent. And also, it needs help. One thing, one tip that I got from different, uh, different people, and I've seen that working well. Is that uh, it's great even when we need a facilitator or at least uh, helpers to actually uh, perform some of it, take on some of the roles. So, one of the roles is, for example, timekeeper. Timekeeping in the retrospective is, is always a challenge, and time is, is a time bound to get to the end without having a, an improvement plan. And that's, that's definitely a no no. We definitely want to, be, to get to the end with an action plan. So, having a timekeeper definitely yeah. helps. Uh, uh, that's a role. Can be uh, someone from the team. Uh, can, uh, you also can uh, definitely describe the project role. You can take notes, uh, display them in the case of a remote retrospective. So again, the facilitator definitely makes your job, your job much much easier because as a facilitator, sometimes you have skin in the game or you have been in the past, you have been maybe a computer in the screen. So you have there is some things to say and to discuss. In addition, to that, you have you know the you have the facilitator. So it's great that the uh, someone else. Uh, uh, in charge of keeping track of time and writing down the action and so on and so forth. So I think that's great. About one hour before, what we do is we collect some data and we talk about what, uh, what kind of data you, know, you want to collect. That requires often a little bit of preparation, not too much. The data that is hard to collect probably I mean, shouldn't be collected. Um, Yes, I'm getting some comments about the, the the voice. I'll try. I'll just you know grab the microphone. I'll get it closer, maybe, um, or maybe not. Maybe I'll use the top. Maybe it's better than those. And you know, uh, can you can hear, you hear me, now? me now? Is that, Is that better? better? I can switch to a different, different microphone. And if not, I'm getting this one. Yeah, so as Tom was moving to a different one, is that better? Does let me let me know better in terms of the uh, voice? Worse. Okay. So let go. Yeah. So, really quickly, I'll grab the microphone. I did uh, grab the microphone from you. 
tu da damo otvjeno, ali bi nekako da Oh, 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 it's a high quality really hope he does the trick. Can you guys see well? <laughs> yes. Doing webinar on the field set of challenges. Can you guys hear me? Is that better quality? You can still hear the echo. No, you can hear or. Make sure that you speak on the microphone. So bear with me a second. Yeah, what's microphone? One, two, one, two. Okay. Is this one any better? I still have the. Uh... Yeah, so in terms of input, all I have is the. Uh... Is those? I, I can also mute it. it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mute. Okay. So, I don't know, it's coming from different microphone, uh, so. Maybe, maybe I can mute the, the room's microphone and unmute this one. Can you guys hear me? Is that any better? Now better? Yeah, can you hear me well now? Do we still have an echo or is that is that okay now? Better. Okay, good. Great, great, great. I'm happy to hear. All right, all right. So let's close that. Go back to, to the presentation. Sorry about that. Okay, so the presentation is coming up. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, so let's talk briefly about preparing the retro. So I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll go back br really quickly about what, uh, what I uh, discussed. So it's important again, you know, to schedule it uh, ahead of time, best if it's scheduled right after the, the sprint review. So people have, you know, the, the information, the insights about uh, how the spring, the sprint concluded fresh in their mind. And you can also ask a uh, good practice to ask people to actually think about insights ahead of time throughout the sprint. You know, if you're a scrum master, you, you know, you can ask people to, uh, to write down, to jot down their insights throughout the retrospective and also make sure that you have a facilitator. A facilitator doesn't have to be the scrum master. So in terms of planning the facilitation, so uh, make sure that you review the feedback from the last retrospective. I mean, you want to uh, not only improve the way the team works, but also the, you want to improve the retrospectives from time to time on the retrospective to be uh, to be a better retrospective uh, make sure that you have an agenda and we we'll look we will look at an agenda uh, a, a typical sort of a canonical agenda uh, and also you know make sure that you uh, you use any opportunity to enlist the help of uh, of team members of, of participants for example something like timekeeping that is uh, it's really hard to uh, to keep an eye on on uh, time so it definitely helps if there's, if there's someone from the, uh, the participants who's in charge of just you know keep uh, timekeeping in addition to participating, and also a scribe that can take notes and publish them later on. So I think that's a that's a great thing to uh, to do. About one hour before, you will probably want to collect some data and set up a shared space. 
So if you need, uh, like I did here, you know, the, I have a presentation that is shared and, uh, and I have, uh, you know, the created some, you know, a poll and, and so on and a whiteboard. So that's something that you need to, uh, to create ahead of time. And connect and test. So I promise I did uh, some testing, but uh, I guess, you know, somehow that, uh, that issue crept in. So we want to try to avoid that. I mean, you lose some valuable, uh, valuable time, as you just uh, saw here, from having to deal with all, you know, the, the technology, uh, you know, the, the audio, the video, you know, it's, uh, it's definitely tricky to get it right. So the more familiar you are with the, uh, with the gear, with the, the setup and the, the more opportunity you have, uh, that definitely uh, helps a lot. So all of that, you know, is all about preparation even before you start the retrospective. So next thing you want to do is to uh, sort of uh, check in, which is really switching the, your mind, you know, from one mode to another. Uh, not uh, not only your mind, but you know, all the participants. Typically, uh, people uh, get into the retrospective fresh from being in the middle of, you know, I don't know, fixing a bug or uh, writing a document or uh, what have dealing with a particular you know design software design problem and you definitely need a different mindset to actually share some information be open to sh uh, to sharing and envisioning solutions so it definitely helps you know to uh, uh, to guide people to lead people through that sort of you know mindset transition and uh, check in is one way to do that so uh, the, uh, you definitely want to uh, over overcome the uh, the uh, the inertia that you have uh, in people's mind and also switch the mood, you know, from the burden of the daily grind uh, to one of opening up to collaboration, sharing information, brainstorming about possible solution, uh, looking at opportunities for people also to be present. So sort of do sort of a reset in their mind. Uh, so that's uh, that's also very helpful. And uh, it's uh, I mean, one way to do that is uh, to do some small talk and uh, but definitely find a way to involve everyone. So you need a little bit more structure. Uh, and uh, you know, one observation that I heard from many people is that is that if people you know speak uh, at the start and they jump into the discussion at the start, they are much more likely to open up and to participate throughout the meeting, which is a great thing, obviously. Uh, so, um, in terms of participation in general, uh, talking about participation, then you definitely want video and sound to encourage people. And you you guys have brought that uh, up that. that uh, this is a, a challenge uh, to uh, to get people to actually open video, the video and the, and the sound. So my recommendation would be definitely to uh, have to create maybe a working agreement that, uh, especially in a retrospective, people should be fully on and fully present. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's definitely a, a challenge in remote retrospectives in particular uh, for people's attention to wander away because they have one screen and they are, and they can you know typically they have multiple screens so they can sort of zone out and browse the web or continue you know fixing that bug or whatever you know they were busy doing before so we want to try to avoid that and uh, checking in definitely helps you with that but also you know having some working agreements where we you ask people to turn on the video and the sound as well so that you can hear people and, uh, and involve all the senses so that's one way to increase participation and attention you do want to have a visible agenda so people know where they are at any point in time uh, and you want to have a shared vi visualization of every Everything that happens uh, during the meeting. So, if people you know zone out for a, for a meeting uh, for for a minute, uh, then they have a way to reconnect, you know, easily. And uh, one one thing that I saw people doing, and I'm I'm doing once in a while as well, is uh, to call on individual on individuals for their their input. Uh, uh, one thing, one tip that I got uh, is that uh, if there are participants you create, you just jot down a list of participants. And every time someone speaks out, you just you know sort of uh, tick a mark next to uh, to this this participant's name, and then you, you can at a glance you can see who actually uh, was uh, did participate in the discussion, who didn't, and for people that didn't participate at all, so I think it's definitely legitimate to ask them. Well, you know, Yuri, what do you think about that? Uh, what's your opinion? So I think it's definitely legitimate that that's a good tool to use. So definitely call uh, call individual out. Uh, you know, as part of the, uh, the, the effort to drain, uh, to draw them out. And uh, obviously you want to be open to suggestions or so encourage people to suggest uh, ideas. So don't shoot down other suggestions when they're bringing them up. So just in terms of ideas, by the way, in terms of, you know, checking in, 
So some nice ideas that I tried out and work quite well. So you can ask people, for example, to uh, actually uh, uh, take a screenshot of, uh, I don't know, their, their uh, Spotify feed or YouTube, you know, what are they hearing right, right now and share that, you know, in a single page, for example, a Google site like, like we just did. Uh, and uh, so it's it's always nice to hear, you know, what people are hearing. Maybe getting some recommendations about, you know, the 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 Netflix series that are, that are currently uh, watching. So, you know, that's one way. And another way to uh, to check in and to sort of uh, break the ice and reset your mind is ask people to take a, a one picture from their workspace, something that maybe you wouldn't expect to see uh, in another workspace, and maybe say a few words about, you know. What this is, you know, why it's in the workspace. Uh, you can use for that your team chat. In that case, that's a, that's going to be WhatsApp. But you know, whatever you guys are using, you know, Slack or whatever. So these are some really quick activities that are, that are fun. They are they, they are definitely help you sort of again, you know, reset you know people's uh, people's mind. And uh, there are there are many ideas. You know, one of them, just uh, one example. There's a uh, this tool here called the checkin.dsa.io. I can just uh, show it to you really quickly. So essentially, that's a check-in uh, questions generator. So you can just you know flip between you know different uh, random questions, and uh, that that would be essentially a question for all of the team members to answer as part of that check-in process. So you can have a few here. If you could rename yourself, what that name? What name would you pick? So these are also sort of you know checking activities. So there are many uh, on the web. And these are, th I think, are pretty nice. All right. So we talked about uh, about checking in and about preparation. And as soon as the presentation is back, uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, data. I think it's very, very important. That's that's actually, you know, very common mistake. I think that team, teams make. Regardless of whether their uh, retrospective is scheduled right after the sprint review or not, I think oftentimes they start right away by talking about, you know, sort of gut feelings and insights, which are important, right? But I think that when those insights are informed by data, then they, are, they tend to be more, more relevant, more connected to our real situation. Uh, so I think it's really important to look at data. And, uh, you know, one thing that you, uh, uh, you can ask yourself is, uh, you know, what kind of data do we have that is already available? Oftentimes, this, this data is really uh, easy to, uh, to, to get, uh, which is actually show, uh, showing how we are doing as a team. Right, so for example, it could be work completed versus work, uh, work planned. Uh, if you have any KPIs that have to do with, you know, quality uptime or business KPIs, then these are also worthwhile looking at. Uh, for example, anything that has to do with your process, like so uh, if you have a, a CI build, a continuous integration build, has there been any downtime? What's the typical recovery time? So uh, these are data points that are worthwhile looking into. A uh, number of the uh, PRs of pull requests, you know, approved, uh, how much, uh, how long does it take for a PR to be approved and so on and so forth. There's, there's uh, so much data that can be uh, collected. And I think that it's, it's really, really meaningful. Uh, and also data, you can also create a timeline, sort of, uh, you know, what what data, uh, you know, can we look at, what event, notable events happened in the last two weeks, assuming that your sprint uh, has been two week, uh, weeks long, because, you know, oftentimes people just remember, recall what happened uh, today and yesterday, but beyond that, it's sort of a black hole. So it's definitely helpful to remind people what happened in the period of time on which you are retrospecting. So that's something that, again, you can do as part of the, the preparation. It's really, really easy to look at the calendar, to look at your email, at all those emails that, are, that have been written in uh, all caps. And uh, so to extract the data and assemble sort of a visual timeline really, really quickly in a slide, I think that's really easy and that makes a difference. And uh, another thing that uh, I seldom see teams doing is collecting information about uh, stakeholders that are not part of the team about uh, what's, uh, what's their sentiment about the, the team's performance. So you can ask, you know, uh, for example, you know, the, the, the PO, so oftentimes the PO that is not a part of the retrospective, or management or customers or uh, the other teams, uh, what, they, what, do, what do they think about the team's performance? What do, do, do they think is a, you know, is a challenge that uh, the team should be, should be improving? So all of that is really, really important. I think that once you have that, that data in front of you, then the team can draw some uh, some really powerful insights that are much better, much higher quality than 
just insights that they, that they draw from their gut feeling based on just you know what they recall from today or yesterday. So one example there is just data from Jira. Jira is one of the common, uh, most common tools, but you know every tool pretty much that, you are, that people use uh, can generate the same data. So for example, velocity. So you want to see that you know there is some predictability that uh, the the workload is balanced, so that the velocity fa is fairly consistent. You know taking into consideration teams availability, especially lately, right? I mean you switch to a different working mode. I mean, how does, uh, does that affect us? What can we learn from that? So that's one thing to look at. Control charts, so to look at uh, essentially cycle time. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a very good indicator of efficiency and speed. So that's also very informative. Uh, things like, you know, sprint summary. So again, plan versus execution. You know, what, uh, what work was pulled out of the sprint, sprint, injected into the sprint, what uh, work actually, uh, spilled over to the next sprint. So all of that, all of that is very, very useful data that I think uh, is definitely worthwhile collecting and presenting to the, to the team. And all of that shouldn't take more than, you know, five minutes. And that's the basis to, uh, to the next item, which is collecting insights. So in terms of uh, which insights, again, we want to base those insights on uh, data. But uh, I think that we want the, focus, the team to focus, uh, to focus on what uh, the team is in control of, right? So oftentimes I see that uh, teams are using 100% of their airtime of their insights to vent about, you know, things that management are doing to them or, you know, outside obstacles. And, uh, and I think that uh, it's, uh, it's good to, uh, to, to have a way to, uh, um, to blow some steam. And, you know, I'm not saying that uh, that's not a good, uh, good thing, but I would, say, I would suggest as a guideline, as a rule of thumb, that at least 50% of the items of the, of the insights should be about things that we as a team can improve. Otherwise, you know, well, we're sort of wasting time to, to a large extent. So uh, in terms of visibility, when you collect those insights, uh, I think it's obvious, but, uh, but you know, I've seen cases when, where that's not the case. You definitely want to uh, write up those uh, insights, put them in a place where all of the participants can see those insights. And that's a way, to, first of all, to, uh, to acknowledge people's input and also to validate it, to make sure that people uh, have been understood so again, you know, visibility is very important. And also uh, try to av avoid groupthink. I mean, one thing that I've seen uh, oftentimes that happens is that uh, we ask people, what's your insight? We even maybe ask, you know, the first person to, uh, to speak up. And once the first speaker, uh, person speaks up, then it's very easy to, for people to shut, shut off their, you know, their creative thinking mode. And just to say, yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, that's an issue, that's a problem, that's a challenge. And uh, I think that uh, there's a lot to lose from having you know this this sort of group thing that is sort of steered by uh, by the input of the of the the first people to speak. So I think that one thing that is great uh, that you should uh, strive to do is to ask participants to silently, independently collect their thoughts, maybe write them down, and only then contribute their insights and perhaps you know reveal them together. Uh, one way that I've, that uh, that I've used is, is the uh, for people to actually use, again, the group chat to write their top insight. And then, you know, at the count of three, all of the, the participants uh, click on, uh, press on enter. And then, you know, there's, so there's no, uh, you sort of cancel that, uh, that uh, group thing sort of uh, phenomenon. And make sure that you, you're inclusive. So make sure that you hear, you, uh, you actually pretty much require all of the people that are present in the, in the retrospective to contribute their input. I think that's very important. So, you know, that's an example of sort of a theoretical, you know, whiteboard where you can see all of the insights and all of the people, all of participants can do that. So when you are on the same location, you can use, you know, whiteboard and sticky notes, that's great. But remotely, you will need some, so, some form of electronic tool. So again, can be any kind of whiteboard or a dedicated tool. And we'll talk about some dedicated tools that I think will do a pretty good job. And one thing that you can do to make sure that you have people's input, all of the participants' uh, input, is to set up a board in which, you know, people's name are actually there on the board so that they have sort of a, a slot in which they can put their contribution. And that way you make sure that people understand that uh, each one, each individual is expected to contribute their own insight. I think that helps a lot. Uh, so that's an example just, you know, from, a, from an example, the WebEx uh, whiteboard, which is not, you know, particularly good, I think. But even that whiteboard can be used to actually collect those insights. The problem with this tool, you know, the main problem 
aside from you know there's no there's no way to easily prioritize and there's no way to to actually create you know sort of sticky notes but uh, one problem is that you know you have no way uh, to uh, to collect that insights uh, that's in or no easy way to collect the insight without others you know seeing what other, what uh, what the rest contributed so again you get sort of that uh, group think problem so the alternatives by the way doesn't have to be uh, improved preserve for example, that's one alternative, uh, stop doing, do less, do more, start doing. So it's good also, you know, sort of to vary the, the way to, to collect the, those insights. And there are different tools. So I listed a few here, for example, you know, Trello and Google Jamboard and so on. And uh, I think there are different, the more important thing here is uh, the different criteria I use, the different considerations to sort of compare those different tools. So you can uh, you can look at that. I'll share that presentation. You can look at that. But there are there are there's really you know a very uh, large amount of the of tools that you can use for that. So that's an example from Trello. It's not actually Trello. That's sort of a mock up of Trello. But that's one way to collect uh, insights so people can uh, actually uh, get those insights on a board. And uh, what you can see is that there's there is a way in uh, in Trello to actually vote for the insights. And I think that uh, it's very, very important to uh, to prioritize the uh, the insights before you start discussing them. So in Trello, that uh, uh, that comes really as part of the tool. So a few more tips. So uh, avoid the, the the temptation to discuss insights issues as they come up. You should separate collection and clarification from discussion and problem solving. I think that you know, oftentimes I see teams that uh, you know, as soon as one issue comes up. Then all of the teams are opinionated and they start discussing that uh, that issue. But that may not be the first one that comes up. May not be the most important one. So I would actually wait, get all of the insights, maybe just clarify them, but uh, wait before you uh, before you you actually start drilling down and problem solving till the, these have been prioritized. So I think it's very important to prioritize. So something like dot voting, for example, for prioritization definitely helps. You may want also to group similar issues, especially if you collected those separately, then uh, the same issue is bound to come up from different people. And that's actually fine. Just validates that it's a really, uh, that it's a, a significant issue. So you want to group those, just not to, uh, for people to waste their votes essentially. And you definitely want to time box that. So, so inside collection should be time box. Uh, so uh, that's very important. And that uh, in general, in terms of time boxing, it's very important to, uh, to manage the time. So uh, the only way, I mean, you you, you definitely uh, you you want to make uh, to make sure that you get to the end of a retrospective with a set with an action plan, and the only way to do that is to tightly manage the time, especially the discussions. These then and the insights collection. This tends to uh, uh, to spill over, and then you get you reach the end of the retrospective, and you don't have an action plan, and that's not a good thing. So again, you know, I mentioned that before, but I'll just reiterate: assigning a timekeeper can make a big difference. If there's someone that you know just you know starts a timer you know on their phone and uh, at the end just uh, reminds all of us as a group that you know time is up we need to move on or at least decide make a conscious decision to, to spend more time on this topic but you know i think that's definitely uh, um, definitely important and for every pretty much every uh, every uh, agenda item you want to have a, a time that is set in advance uh, so uh, next thing is uh, problem solving so uh, um, you definitely want. I mean, some of the uh, some of the problems that come up may have an obvious solution, but oftentimes, you know, it's not the case. And you definitely want to have a way to uh, to uh, drill down into those problems, make sure that you get to the to to the root cause. And so, you know, there are different techniques to the to do that. You know, two of them you may have heard of is five whys and fishbone analysis. Again, the, the way to do that in the context of a remote retrospective is to do that visually using a shared whiteboard. I think that's a great way. Uh, I think that you know the temptation to jump right into a, an action plan without actually uh, uh, doing some real uh, uh, drill down and real uh, problem solving is of, oftentimes uh, misguided. Uh, this guy, uh, I think he was a journalist, once said that for every complex problem there's an answer, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. And oftentimes that def that's definitely the case. So you definitely want to invest in many cases in pro in real problem solving in a, in a, in an, in root cause analysis. 
So, you know, that's just an example. Let's say that a CI build failure recovery time is too long. So, you know, maybe developers, you know, the reason is that developers don't give you the priority, right? So they will continue to work on their on their regular work before they jump into uh, solving, you know, the, the, the reason, uh, the problem with the, the build. And, but, you know, we can ask why and, you know, and sometimes, you know, people assume, developers assume that someone else broke the build, it's not me, right? So why should I do something about it? And the reason is that you know many commits in, go into a single build, so it's a so it's not a single commit. Commit, and then then it's how to trace back to a specific developer. And uh, the reason may be that most commits you know happen at the end of the day. And, uh, and the reason that that's that's the way it is that you know the build takes a long time, so there's no point in checking in early. So the root cause is actually that the build takes a long time. So that's what we need to solve because just you know nagging people you know to uh, to give it a priority. I mean. That's a solution. That's a pretty poor solution. So it's definitely worthwhile to drill down to get to the root cause and actually work on the root cause. Uh, so another another way is a fishbone diagram. Essentially, uh, you look at the problem and you uh, separate uh, the problem into different dimensions. So in that case, that can be sort of tools and process, people, measurement, environment, technology, and then you ask people to actually list different contributing factors for all those, uh, those, those different uh, axes. Uh, and based on that, you can get a, a better idea of you know, what is the root cause. So again, you know, uh, a different, uh, different example here about a low rate of finish, finished working sprint. And so there are different uh, suggestions here, but uh, you can then you know, prioritize those and try to figure out which one uh, will have the most impact. If we work on, on, a, on a particular one, you know, maybe on the story's maturity, then you know maybe that's the, that's where you know we have the the low hanging fruit. So that's actually a screenshot that I I took from a, an actual team that a, one of our coaches at Agile Sparks worked with from a session using Jamboard uh, doing a, a fishbone analysis. So it's blurred on purpose so you don't see you know, the the details. But you know that's an example of doing that in a in a visual uh, in a collaborative way. So just a few more tips about problem solving. So first of all, if you're not sure about the solution, I think an experiment is a great action item. It doesn't have to be a, a, real, a real action item. It could be an, an experiment. Uh, you also want to assume that people have good intentions. So, uh, so people don't care is the, usually not a solution. Uh, you want to visualize, prob visualize problem solving. We talked about that before. And uh, that brings us to, uh, to an action plan. So we did some uh, problem solving. You definitely want to, uh, in addition, in addition to that, to uh, uh, to get uh, to grab some uh, real action items from those uh, from this problem solving. And you definitely must have an action plan at the end of a retrospective. Otherwise, you're pretty much wasted people's time. Uh, and the action plan should be realistic, relevant to the most important ch challenges. We want to affect not changes, but challenges rather. People should be willing to take on action items. Otherwise, you know, find some different action items. And uh, each, each action item should be small and concrete. So someone mentioned that as a challenge that they have. So you definitely want to have, you know, the to identify the next small step that you can uh, that you can perform to actually uh, help solve that uh, the problem that uh, that you identified. So typically, the time uh, the time horizon should be, you know, one sprint. So what can we do in the next sprint? That will be uh, that will actually yield some uh, results or conclu conclusions uh, by the end of the sprint that will actually uh, you know move us for forward in uh, in uh, solving that ch challenge. So, for example, people sometimes say, "Well, we need to improve user stories maturity." That's great, but you know that's not really actionable. That's not that's very that's a direction and not necessarily an action item. So, you know, maybe something like meet with a PO one day before planning to define a certain criteria. That's something that is more, you know, concrete, definitely relevant, and that's definitely act actionable. So the, you definitely want to strive with uh, to strive to really, really small and concrete action items. So another example: start managing technical debt. So you know that's a great, uh, great idea, but you definitely want to have something that is really action actionable, like maybe create a list of top three pro problematic areas and uh, and the time estimate to reduce maintenance maintenance time by fifty percent. So that's the first step. Maybe that's not going to solve the, the problem, but that's that's definitely get us, you know, some more understanding, some more insights into the problem, and uh, you know, based on that, maybe we can create a real uh, action plan. 
So and, and for each uh, action item, uh, you definitely want to include, you know, what, who, and when. Otherwise, again, you know, there's a good chance it's not, not going to happen. Right, so again, use a tool to communicate that, to keep track of that. So it can be, you know, Jira, a wiki, uh, email a list, but you definitely want to have something that has sort of that format, you know, what do we want to do, who's going to do that, and by when. Otherwise, you know, again, there's a good chance it's not going to happen. So again, like I said before, uh, experiments are, are great action items. Uh, and uh, so if we are trying to solve something, we can uh, uh, we, we can try to do something and see, uh, you know, if um, if it helps, we, we want to, to understand, you know, what do we expect to see? So improve by or change something. So example, we, we are trying to increase the percent of user stories completed before the sprint, before the sprint ends. We will write acceptance criteria for all user stories before sprint planning in the coming sprint. If it helps, we expect to see complete completion rate improve from 50%, 57%, assuming that's the current average over the last three sprints, to 70%, right? So if you don't have any expectations, you won't have any surprises. And if you don't have any surprises, you know, you won't have any learning. So uh, so I think experiment, experiments are a great way, you know, to, uh, to actually move forward and to improve. So here's an example, again, from Trello, not that, that I'm trying to sell Trello as the best, you know, way to manage uh, your improvement, but that's definitely a decent way, and it's uh, mostly free up to a, to, to a size. Uh, so you can see that here, you know, there is a way to uh, actually assign action items to individuals, and you can set a deadline, a due date. So I think that's, uh, you know, that's definitely what you want to, uh, to have in uh, as part of your action plan. And uh, last but not least, uh, you should uh, aim to improve the retrospectives. So uh, one thing that you can track and uh, something that takes really just, you know, a couple of minutes at the end of each meeting and in particular retrospective can ask people, you know, what was the return on time invested? I mean, if you guys as a team, you know, we just spent, you know, one hour uh, talking about things that we can improve. And uh, was that hour really worth, uh, worth the time? Was, was the outcome really worth the, the time that we invested? And you can use just, you know, sort of a feast of five, you know, for people to vote. Uh, between you know one being a total a, a total waste of my time you know if I didn't participate or that, that meeting didn't happen it wouldn't have made a difference to five which was you know su superb use of my time so you can vote by video that works uh, fine you can use your hands or you can use a tool like you know for example mentimeter.com I think that both uh, work fine but that's a that's a sure way to actually get a, a quick reading on the on the the, the, the the quality of the time that you invested in that meeting. And if some people, you know, actually voted uh, three and below, you can actually go around and ask them, okay, what's, that, what's one thing that you guys think that we should do next time so that you, you would feel comfortable, you know, voting, you know, uh, you know, from three to four or from four to five. Okay, so that's, a, that's one thing that you can do. Uh, so we talked about Roti Vote. You definitely want to thank people for participating and contributing. It's a definitely... Uh, that helps you know people to understand that it's definitely desired that it's expected, and that's uh, that we expect people to actually uh, do that again you know next time. And you definitely want to summarize the action plan. People should be very clear about what the, the action plan is. Uh, and one one of the top, top challenges that you know that I've seen in teams is that the same issues keep coming up time and over again. That gives people really a feeling that you know the retrospective is sort of a waste of time. And uh, the best way to actually prevent that, or you know, one of the ways definitely, is to make sure that you are following up on the action plan. So actually, you know, start the next retrospective with a review of the uh, of last retrospectives, and you know, maybe even before that, uh, action action plan, the action items, and see uh, first of all, have we done that? You know, uh, and if so, have they really helped us? And if so, do we want to make that part of our working agreement? of our definition of ready, definition of done. So it's very, very important to, uh, to perform that follow-up. Otherwise, again, you know, you don't get uh, as much as you could from the retrospectives. So an overall plan, you know, based on what we discussed so far, an overall plan could be something like just, you know, five minutes where you set the stage, you welcome people and do sort of a basic check-in. And then five more minutes to do a follow-up on the action items from the previous retrospective. And then maybe five minutes just to go over data, look at data. 
and then maybe 10 minutes to uh, to uh, get insights from people and prioritize those. Again, I think it's very, very important not to drill down into the discussion of the uh, of the insights at that point, just collect them. Otherwise, it's not going to take 10, 10 minutes. And the majority of the time in the retrospective, I think, should be dedicated to uh, problem solving. So taking the, the insight that is uh, that is uh, the most important based on the votes uh, of people on people's vote and actually do a you know a real problem solving session using five wise fishbone analysis or, or a, a different way to to drill down and again try to make that very visual and vis uh, and, and uh, give away you know for people really to participate in that uh, in that problem solving session and at the end you want to come up with an action plan that uh, that people are willing to to take on and again, that action plan is very important that, that uh, you have some small action items there and, uh, and you identify who is the person that owns that action item and, uh, and by when you want to complete it. And at the, ver the very end, summarize, close and do maybe some uh, royalty vote. So, so that's a plan, sort of a, a canonical plan for a, a one hour long retrospective that, uh, that works quite well in my experience. And uh, one comment about, you know, in general, uh, remote retrospective is that you definitely need more structure. So, you know, this type of structure can make a difference. So maybe when you are doing, you know, co-located retrospective can be uh, maybe loose to some extent. Uh, even then, I think a structure, having structure is a good thing. But I think that it's, it's even more important when you are working remotely. So I definitely recommend that. And uh, you know, try to keep it interesting. So it's not only uh, not only about you know this particular. I mean, this particular uh, you know plan is, uh, is is definitely a decent plan, and you can do that every time around. But I think it's, uh, after a while it can be uh, can start to be boring. So I would try to uh, to to vary you know the content of the retrospective. Maybe dedicate one retrospective to a team health check, like for example the Spotify team health check, which which is quite popular. Or you know maybe focus one retrospective on, on a on a specific topic or question. So definitely, or maybe do a different activity. Watch a maybe an inspiring you know video about you know uh, an interesting way to work and discuss that. So definitely try to add some variation to uh, to your retrospectives. Just uh, one last last thing about uh, tools. I think there are uh, you know there are at least three tools that uh, are dedicated to managing retrospectives. These are, you know, Retrium and Team Retro and Fun Retro. These are some, actually some, some decent tools. They typically cost money. They will give you maybe 30, a 30-day trial for free. But uh, beyond that, they cost money. I think that they are, it's definitely worthwhile to invest in those. And, uh, you know, the thing that they help you with is, uh, you know, with the follow-up, with the, uh, the collection of the insights. They do that quite well. And the prioritization and with creating an action plan. So uh, you may, may want to try these out. So uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, one thing that I would like to hear from you is, uh, first of all, you know, your takeaways from, the, from what we have just uh, uh, discussed here. If there's one thing or more that, you're that you, uh, you think you can take to your team or your teams. So I'd love to hear, from, uh, to hear about that. And also, so I'll, I'll share the link here. And, uh, and also to, uh, to hear from you if you have your own tip about uh, retrospectives. So uh, I would love to hear that as well. So I'll, I'll put that in a, in the chat, the link to that uh, to this board. So I would love to give your input to get to get your input, and also feel free to ask questions in the uh, in the chat. So any question that you have, uh, I'll use you know the the next few minutes to uh, uh, to answer these, or you know actually uh, other participants can also you know uh, jump in and uh, and try to uh, to provide some answers. So let's try to do that together. So you guys should have the link. Yeah, I see that people are joining, great. So again, one thing that you are taking away you know, from this uh, session, one thing that you can try to do in your retrospective, and again, if you do have a tip, your contribution, I would love to hear.
All right, so timekeeper and scribe, yeah, that's a, I definitely, you know, give it a try and uh, you you won't want to do it any differently, any different way. So that's a, I think that's a, that's really a, an easy hack that makes a big difference. So five wise fishbone, you know, definitely try it out. Invest more in the check-in. Yes, definitely. Nominating helpers, right? So let's look also at the, the tips that people put, put in. So use humor. I completely agree with that. Uh, so start with a funny video. Uh, I think it's a, I found it to be a bit challenging to uh, display a video in remote. I think that, you know, when people are co-located, it's, it's fine. But uh, some of the tools that you use to actually share a video and for all, all of the people to see the, the video at the same time is a bit challenging. But uh, maybe some tools, you know, can do it better than, than other. But definitely start putting a laugh on people's face is definitely a great way to do that reset, that, that mindset shift that I was talking about before. I, I totally agree with that. And don't make too retrospective with the same process or tweak. Uh, you know, from my experience, it's fine. I mean, you can have the same, you know, the same uh, sort of plan or the same agenda for a few times, but definitely, uh, you know, after a while, it gets it gets boring. So you definitely want to have some variation in there, and maybe even ask people to come up with ways, different ways to uh, to hold a retrospective. Remove the taboo of of showing your personal space. Uh, yeah. Definitely, I can show you mine if I can move the the my laptop around. Not a whole lot interesting to see, but yes, definitely, it's actually quite interesting to see how people work. All right, great guys. So feel free to to uh, to continue to use that board and to uh, to use it to share ideas. Uh, in general, in closing, I would uh, I would like to. Uh, First of all, invite you. I just switch, switch really quickly. So, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, for your participation, for for being here, and for contributing actively to this uh, to this session. Uh, thank you for enduring the the, the, the technical uh, problems that we had initially with the, uh, for telling me about it uh, that we had initially. It was I'm happy that we uh, were able to uh, to resolve those. So uh, you can find more about uh, you know different trainings and services that we have at that link uh, on our site. We have some uh, we have a blog and a very interesting I think uh, blog there that you can uh, look at and uh, so uh, feel free to uh, to visit us there. Uh, you can email me. I'm Sagi at Agile Sparks. Uh, if you want, I, I do have a retrospective uh, cheat sheet that can I can share. So drop me an email and I'll be happy happy to share that with you. Uh, feel free to connect with me on uh, Twitter or link, LinkedIn. And uh, again, thank you very much for uh, for being here, and uh, and good luck with your retrospectives. So, bye bye. <laughs>